we're going to get started for this last session before lunch. We're going to, this is dedicated to fault friction and how the uh, pilot implementation and uh, we're going to run through both a static, quasi-static uh, cases as well as a dynamic case. Um, so quasi-static simulations, dynamic simulations, fault constitutive models, static friction, slip weakening, and rate and state friction. Uh, nonlinear solver parameters, once you use friction, you have to switch from just using a linear solver to a nonlinear solver. Um, in the dynamic simulations, we'll have absorbing boundary conditions. Uh, we're going to use time-dependent boundary conditions on for to drive the fault slip. We're going to actually do a little earthquake cycle, quasi-static example. Um, and for the uh, dynamic case, we have uh, time-dependent uh, fault traction perturbations. So here's our uh, generic domain potato shaped with uh, a fault in the middle. Um, remember, we have um, the uh, the tractions across the fault are coupling the are coupling the two sides together, and they correspond to Lagrange multipliers. Here's that formulation for the governing equations. So here's our nor normal Neumann boundary condition, um, weighting integral over the surface weighting function times the tractions. So for our faults, we do the same thing where our our attractions are the Lagrange multipliers. And then a, we have our constraint equation where we have the slip minus the relative displacement equal to zero. Um, so that in the case of fault friction, the shear components of the Lagrange multiplier are limited by the fault constitutive model. So we're going to compute what the tractions are from the fault constitutive model and compare to those to the Lagrange multiplier. Um, Here's our, our uh, we explicitly formulate in terms of a coefficient of friction. Um, we would like to uh, sort of, we're thinking about how we can sort of provide a more generic fault constitutive model so someone can say, you know, I want the opening or, you know, something to be sort of less, less uh, so it wouldn't have to be a sliding boundary condition. It could, someone could, who's trying to model a dike could uh, put in some other sort of uh, sort of uh, mode one opening type uh, fault constitutive model, but right now it's limited to that the the shear the friction is uh, has a cohesion minus the coefficient of friction times the normal traction. That's using a normal traction less than zero uh, for compression, normal traction greater than zero for tension. Um, our friction model says that when the normal traction is greater than zero, that this go this term goes to zero. And there's, uh, but you'd still have a cohesion. However, we have another additional constraint that says with compression, we have no interpenetration, and with opening, we have a free surface. So the traction normal times the displacement normal is always equal to zero. So if our normal traction is, uh, is not zero, then the, that means the uh, displacement has to be equal to zero. If our normal traction is uh, is zero, that means our displacement uh, can be zero or it can be non-zero. So in other words, this will be a free surface. But obviously, we don't allow uh, interpenetration. So as soon as um, the fault would try to interpenetrate, then we have equal and opposite traction uh, in the normal direction to keep uh, preclude interpenetration. Um, this is the nuts and bolts of the solution algorithm for friction uh, on one slide. So we perform, at the beginning of each time step, we perform a nonlinear iteration, assuming, uh, hold on, let me, I don't, did I en enable my microphone? Yes, I did. Okay, just check it. Um, so uh, we perform a nonlinear iteration, assuming no additional slip, and then we check to see if the fault constitutive model is satisfied. If the fault constitutive model is satisfied, then uh, the residual will be equal to zero, and we don't have to do anything. The fault is locked. Um, if there are any point is move is where the fault constitutive model is not satisfied, then we want to estimate the slip 
um, to reduce the traction down to the point where it, it satisfies the fault constitutive model. So here's where we uh, extract the subset of the system associated with the fault. So here's I've denoted sort of points on the neg on the positive side of the fault, points on the negative side of the fault. Um, there's no uh, cross terms except coming from the Lagrange multipliers are displacements on the positive and negative side of the fault, and then sort of a right hand side. And what we want to do is we want to calculate the perturbation in the Lagrange multipliers necessary to satisfy the friction criteria. Um, so what we do is we formulate uh, these two equations. Um, that's the perturbation. And uh, so we have a perturbation in the Lagrange multipliers on the right-hand side, perturbations in the displacements. And then we're going to solve for our perturbations uh, in the displacement field and then um, compute the perturbation in the slip field from that. So we know the perturbation in the Lagrange multipliers because at the beginning of our uh, nonlinear solve, we compared what the Lagrange multipliers were to the friction criteria. So that's our perturbation in the Lagrange multipliers necessary to satisfy the friction. So that's our right-hand side. We're taking into account the orientation. Um, and then we do this solve to get what our perturbations in our displacement field are. Take that perturbation in the displacement field to compute the perturbation in the slip. So that's updating the right-hand side. Then we can, with this updated slip, we can then do another nonlinear iteration to see if uh, we satisfy the fault constitutive model. So that's um, that's the iteration, one iteration. Um, this inner solve we call the friction sensitivity solve. Um, it also has a, a linear solver um, that uh, generally, because this is such a small system, the defaults will work pretty well. But in some cases, you may want to update uh, the uh, and improve the uh, the preconditioner used for that inner solve. So here's just a synopsis of what I mentioned before about our new friction formulation. We're changing the meaning of the Lagrange multiplier. Uh, we'll be recomputing the Jacobian when switching from lock to sliding. That gives us much better updates on what uh, the displacement field is. We eliminate that friction sensitivity solve and, can, and uh, end up with much faster convergence. So that's what we will be working on over the summer. Um, and so now to solve our parameters, we touched a little bit on this uh, in the debugging session. Um, you need to be aware that the uh, spontaneous rupture has this additional parameter, the, the zero tolerance for the faults. Um, you need to make sure the linear solver has a tighter tolerance than the fault to zero tolerance for the, to get the fault to lock. So what we do is we specify a very small value for the relative tolerance in the linear solve, and then uh, an absolute tolerance that's usually one order of magnitude smaller than the zero tolerance. For the nonlinear solve, you want your uh, absolute tolerance to be a little bigger. It needs to be a bigger tolerance than the linear solve. Otherwise, you're never going to converge. Um, and then, and you want to drive it, but also by an absolute tolerance, not a relative tolerance. So here's what generally what we use um, when we're doing friction problems. So our zero tolerance, and you can, depending on how much, uh, what your scales are in the problem, how you non-dimensionalize it, and uh, sort of how tight of tolerances you want in your solve, um, you can bump all of these up or down by, you know, a couple orders of magnitude. Generally, you wouldn't want to go, I think, smaller than this. So here our zero tolerance is 10 to the minus 11. Um, then our linear solver tolerances, and these are in non-dimensionalized um, units. So we set our relative tolerances to 10 to the minus 20 so that the relative tolerances won't be used. Um, and then we set our absolute tolerance here, linear solver, one order t magnitude smaller than the zero tolerance, and the SNES absolute tolerance, one magnitude bigger than the zero tolerance. Um, and here's where I've changed my friction preconditioner to ASM with, and then use the uh, sub-PC factor shift type non-zero. Um, so this will help drive my that inner sensitivity solve um, to faster convergence than the default. Uh, fault constitutive models. 
We have static friction, slip weakening friction, time weakening, and rate and state. Um, there are uh, some additional, I would call them much less popular fault constituent models that have been used to uh, in running SCEC dynamic rupture benchmarks. So in those benchmarks, some of them have the, have quirky perturbations on slip weakening friction. Um, and so we need, in order to run those benchmarks, we implemented those. Um, but here's are the sort of the main four. Um, they would be listed as, com well, three of those are common, static friction, slip weakening, and rate and state. Static friction, coefficient of friction is equal to a value that doesn't change with time. Uh, what happens is that uh, when you're running a quasi-static problem, in this case, um, you'll get slip continues even once the threshold is reached. But you can't get stick slip behavior with static friction because you need the weakening for the fault to stick again. Um, so it's generally only used in static simulations. Slip weakening, uh, the fault uh, coefficient of friction decreases linearly with slip until it reaches some threshold. We label that, call that threshold D0, also known as the slip weakening parameter. And then once the slip has reached D0, it remains at some uh, dynamic coefficient of friction. So linear transition from static coefficient of friction to dynamic coefficient of friction over as the slip progresses from uh, 0 to D0. And uh, once the, once the um, fault has, uh, once the fault has stopped sliding, then we reset uh, sort of the relative amount of displacement or slip back to zero. So um, once the fault, uh, this allows, this provides uh, the stick slip behavior. Um, we have, so here, this is in terms of slip. You can do the same things in terms of time. Um, this is just a new, more numerically stable algorithm uh, or friction implementation. Um, uh, compared to slip weakening because in a dynamic simulation you can say how fast it weakens. Um, so if, as the rupture propagates it doesn't uh, become narrower and narrower, lower than a smaller scale than what you can resolve numerically. Um, it's, there's no physics behind this one, it's just a numerical convenience other than the fact that the fault weakens. Uh, here's the rate and state uh, friction model. So here's our you know, normal rate and state dependence on the logarithm of the velocity and the state variable. That's what is shown up here on the right-hand side. So logarithm of slip rate, linear variation, and the coefficient of friction. Now, because we have um, iterative solvers, uh, we have to deal with what happens to the friction as we have very small slip rates. Uh, our slip rates, uh, we don't want to deal with zero, and so um, what we've done is we've regularized it instead of using some of the uh, hyperbolic functions that Jim Rice has used to regularize. What we did is we've, say, below some threshold, this, this is generally around your uh, zero tolerance for the friction, um, we're going to have a linear variation in the coefficient of friction down to uh, some minimum value. So um, this gives, sort of cuts off what the minimum coefficient of friction is. This helps um, stabilize the system when you're sort of just starting to slip right around these very small slip rates. Um, uh, if you allow this to go down to zero, um, then it it, it uh, causes our sort of the, iter the nonlinear solver it takes a lot more iterations to converge. So this is just a way that we chose to regularize it that uh, gives less variation in the coefficient of friction than some other ways to regularize it. But generally, you're operating here. Um, the, the rate state is operating here over several orders of magnitude slip rates um, that are well above sort of how you're regularizing it down near zero. Just something to be aware of. We regularize different than uh, some other people. And that's mainly because we're dealing with uh, an iterative solver and quasi-static simulations. Um, these, excuse me? This is non-dimensional. Um, so uh, the main components when you're doing the uh, fault friction uh, is now uh, we use the fault cohesive DIN object 
doing for dynamic as opposed to kinematic. You have the friction model, that's the fault constitutive model. Track perturbation, that's for prescribing uh, spatial and or temporal variations in the fault tractions. And then uh, the nonlinear solver. Here's an example of using the uh, fault cohesive dynamic object. So the first, the default is the kinematic object. So the first thing you need to do is uh, replace the fault and specify that you want to use the fault cohesive dynamic object. Um, then uh, we need to specify within the fault the friction model or the um, the uh, whatever fault constituent model you want. Then you need to set the properties for that uh, fault constituent model. And here I've used the uniform database. Coefficient of friction of 0 0.6, cohesion of 0 megapascals, traction perturbation. Um, in this case, I was specifying a uh, initial traction perturbation, and I gave it some spatial database. 